Awesome. Hi, guys. Super excited to be back with you and help you guys for now Chem 1AA3. Um, I think Robbie explained a little bit about the weekly session. So today I'm just going to be going over um, review of acids and bases and buffers. And I'm specifically sticking to the stuff that will help you guys for your midterm. Um, but this tutorial session is different from the session that's happening on Sunday. So you're going to notice if you come to both that they're going to have the same theory components, so like the same lessons, but the questions are going to be, I've changed them all. So they're completely different. So students who do come to both will find um, them helpful. This one is mostly supposed to, like when I was creating it, I had in mind to prepare you guys for understanding. So make sure that you guys understand everything and you, uh, there's still going to be a lot of practice questions. And then on Sunday, for that midterm prep, that one specifically focused on prepping you guys completely for your midterm. So um, for that one, I've made sure that there is at least one of each type of question that you're going to see on your midterm. It's going to be very, very similar to past midterms. I used um, the 2020 and 2019 um, past midterm exams for, for Chem 1A3 to create that one. And then there's also going to be next week's tutorial session, which will cover um, the second half of concepts. And that one, again, is just going to be more lessons and practice questions. Um, but the midterm one is really, really exam focused. So yeah, let, um, the survey will be helpful to see what you guys think about this different kind of tutorial. Okay, so we're going to start with review of acids and bases. We won't spend too much time here. But the questions, again, that I've picked out are ones that you need to have a good understanding of before we can talk about other things like buffers and then later on titrations. Okay, so just for quick review, we should know that a strong acid is something that dissociates completely. And so we, we want to re remember to write this right arrow sign. Okay, so um, you'll see this a lot um, on different topics. And that's why we're reviewing it again. So in buffers, when we see anything that's strong reacting, we want to make sure that we see an arrow to the right. And I'll, I'll mention that again, when we're on buffers. The next thing that we want to go over are what are the strong acids. So this is important as well to know, um, it's going to come up a lot in problems. And this understanding will help you on the midterm as well. So you want to make sure you memorize each of these strong acids. And you should be able to, if you're shown one on the exam, you have to be able to identify, oh, this is a strong acid. And that's going to change the way we look at its reaction, because we know that they dissociate completely. OK. And then how do weak acids differ? So it has to do with their dissociation. Because they're weaker, we don't see a complete dissociation anymore. Instead, we're going to see an equilibrium arrow. These ones aren't strong enough to push all the way to the right. And so you get some um, re of the reaction going back. So it goes back and forth. We have an equilibrium um, reaction. So here we're looking at HA, which is our weak acid. So that's representing a weak acid. We're going to react it with water in this equilibrium reaction. So that's going to represent our base. Okay, and then on the right side, you have we've deprotonated our acid. And so we're looking at the conjugate base of our acid. Just reviewing some terms. And then we've protonated water to get H3O plus, and that's water's conjugate acid. OK, so one thing here, because we have an equilibrium reaction, is we can write a Ka expression, right? K, we can write these for equilibrium reactions. And again, remember, we're doing products over reactants. So that's why I would do A minus times H3O plus over HA. Remember that because water is a liquid, we won't ever include that in K expressions. OK, now why, why do we care about this? Well, if we're asked to solve for pH of a weak acid, and we'll look at examples of this, um, so for a weak acid, you'd actually have to use this equation here and solve for the H plus, and then we can solve for pH. Whereas for a, a strong acid, because it dissociates completely, if you have the um, concentration of your strong acid, that's just going to be equal to this concentration of H plus, and then you can use that to solve for pH. So that's, again, how the, knowing these reactions is going to come in handy. The last thing that I wanted to go over quickly was just what does a higher Ka mean? So um, this is one of the things that your prof said to know for the review. So this is just what I wanted to go over. So a higher Ka means, if we look at a higher Ka, it means that 
remember we have products over reactant. So it means we're getting more products, but when we're thinking about acids, what does that mean? So it means that the acid is able to dissociate more. So you're getting more products. And so we have a stronger acid. So just be familiar with that again. Okay, so now we're just gonna look at the exact same thing for bases to review bases. Okay, so um, so what are strong bases? So strong bases, again, the, um, what's, what's unique about them is they're able to dissociate completely, just like we saw for strong acids. Okay, so these, these are gonna dissociate completely. We again see that arrow going to the right and it dissociates into ions. So we have the sodium plus ion and hydroxide ion in this case. Now, again, we wanna memorize the strong bases and where we can find those strong bases. So you want to be familiar with these. So um, it's just group one and two, hydroxides, group one and two oxides, and um, group one and two hydrides. So if you see any element bound to an oxygen, any element bound to a hydroxide, any element in groups one and two bound to a hydride, then you automatically know it's a strong base. And we'll look at examples of this, okay? Versus, let's talk about weak bases now. So for weak bases, they dissociate incompletely. And so they're not that strong and strong enough to push all the way to the right. And we're actually gonna get equilibrium arrows. So here I have my base on the left, and it's specifically a weak, some weak base. And so on the right side, I'm gonna protonate it and I'm gonna show that this is its conjugate acid, okay? For weak substances, we're gonna react them with water when we write out their reactions. So water is gonna be our acid in this case. And then we're gonna show that it gets deprotonated on the left. And so we have its conjugate base. Because we have an equilibrium reaction, we can again write a K and we just call it KB because this is for a base. We have our products over reactants. So we've just written in our products over reactants. Again, water is not included because it's a liquid. Okay. And just like we saw, stronger acids have a higher KA value. It's the same for bases. Stronger bases have a higher KB value because it means they're able to dissociate more. So they're stronger. Okay. And just a reminder that if you see um, if you're told any acid or base on your midterm that we did not just talk about, so it's not one of these bases or it's not one of the strong acids we looked at, then you have to assume that it's weak for the problem that we're going to, that, that we'll see. And it's going to be like that on your midterm as well. Okay, now I just wanted to quickly go over these different equations and we're only reviewing this again because this is still important for the midterm. It seems like, oh, you guys already learned this before, but it's... Um, you wouldn't want to get to a hard question on your midterm, fill it out completely, and then just not be able to do the last little part. So that's what these equations are going to help you with. We'll just quickly review some of or review like the, the main ones. So between if you have H plus and you're interested in pH or vice versa, we have these two um, main equations, which, we, which we're probably very familiar with. So we have pH is equal to negative log H plus H plus is equal to 10 to the negative pH. Now, very similar equations, if we're instead interested in pOH and OH minus, um, we have the other equations here where, where, where we'll instead take pOH is equal to negative log OH minus, for example. Now, the way to connect pH and pOH, there's an equation which we should know, and that's pH plus pOH is equal to 14. And then finally, this one isn't as commonly used, but Kw not commonly used for this semester, Kw is equal to OH minus times H plus. These equations will actually come in more come, ha come in handy um, when we're talking about buffers. So we'll touch on them then, but pretty much they also share the same form as the pH is equal to negative log H plus equation. Just instead of H, you now just plug in your Ka. So given a Ka, you can solve for pKa and vice versa. You can do the same thing for PKB. Okay, this, the, the next equation that would be helpful for us to know, again, is pH plus pOH is equal to 14. And, and then down here, there's another key equation that will come in handy for you guys on your midterm. And that one is this one where Ka times Kb is equal to Kw. And you should know that Kw is equal to one times 10 to the negative 14. So the, re the way that this one will come in handy is if we're given a KB value and we actually need the KA value. So you would just rearrange this to solve for KA. So you have this equation 
rearrange to solve for Ka. So in this case, it would just be Kw over the Kb. You'd have to know that Kw, the, the number for that is one times 10 to the negative 14. And then you just plug in whatever Kb value that your, the question gives you, and that gives you your Ka that you need. Okay, the last equation that we're going to review before we look into examples is percent ionization. So percent ionization is usually we're talking about an acid, but it's looking at how much acid dissociated, so the concentration of H plus, over how much, how much acid did we initially start with? So whatever that value is, and then just multiply that by 100 to get a fraction. So that's how you use that um, equation. So if someone's asking about the link to the recording, I'm not sure exactly when that's gonna be sent, but I think it'll be in the next few days. Okay, so let's try this first problem together. It says calculate the pH and um, it's asking what is the pH? So just one thing, I know this seems a little bit simple for you guys, you might be like, oh, what? There won't be questions like that on our midterm. But um, so what I did was I made the midterm prep booklet first and made it extremely, um, like tailored to the midterm. And then if I thought that, you know, certain questions were hard um, and you needed certain understanding for those questions, I put those in the weeklies. And this one was actually very similar as well to a question on um, a past midterm. So I did insert a lot of other similar questions to past midterms here as well. So it's kind of like extra practice for you guys in this tutorial. Okay, so let's see if we can solve this question. It says, what is the pH of certain concentration of magnesium hydroxide. Now, right away, we have to figure out, am I looking at an acid or a base? Because it has hydroxide, you should, we should be thinking, oh, that's, that's gotta be a base, right? Okay, and now, because anytime we're dealing with acids or bases, we really wanna think about what their reaction looks like. And so here, in order to figure out the reaction, we have to think, is this a strong base or a weak base? So if we remember, anything in group one and two, any group one and two hydroxide, so here we have a hydroxide, um, any group one or two hydroxide is a strong base and magnesium is in group two. So that actually tells me that this is a strong base. Okay, now I can figure out how this would dissociate. So I know that because it's strong, it's gonna dissociate completely. So we're gonna have an arrow pointing completely to the right. We're gonna dissociate it into its ions. Okay, and here you always want to remember to balance the equation. And if you forgot to balance the equation when you were, if you were doing, when you were doing this problem, you would actually get it wrong, um, the answer wrong. So here, there are two hydroxides on the left, and so we actually need to put a two on the right. And now we have a completely balanced equation. Okay, so we're told that the concentration of our strong base is one times ten to the negative four molar. And because it's a strong base, again, it's dissociating completely. We can use that concentration to figure out what the concentration of hydroxide ion is here. Okay, so we're just gonna use the coefficients in the balanced chemical reaction. Because this actually has a coefficient of two, whereas this one has one, we wanna multiply this concentration by two. And so you're gonna get two times 10 to the negative four molar as the concentration of hydroxide that we end up with. Okay, so now we've just figured out the hydroxide's concentration. And by the way, if you guys miss something or you wanna look over the solutions, I won't be able to send you like these specific notes. So make sure you're taking notes, um, but I will be able to send you guys solutions um, for the problems that we go through today. Okay, so we have our hydroxide con concentration. We're being asked to solve for pH. So now we have to think, okay, how do I get to pH now? So one way to do this is you can first solve for pOH. Using the pOH is equal to negative log OH minus equation. So all we're gonna do here is plug in our hydroxide concentration, two times 10 to the negative four. And you're gonna get a pOH value of 3.7 when you do this. Okay, now that you have pOH, we have to think, okay, how do I get pH from that? And there was an equation that I went over that is pH plus pOH is equal to 14. So here we're interested in solving for pH 
that's going to be equal to 14 minus POH. So 14 minus 3.7, and we're going to get a final answer of pH is equal to 10.3. Okay, so here we had to first recognize we have a strong base. We wrote out its chemical reaction, and we figured out the concentration of the hydroxide. Then we solved for pOH, and finally we solved for pH. Um, someone's asking, how do we know when to use an ice table? So, um, so here we knew we did not have to uh, use that because we have a strong substance. We'll, um, and it's, it's, we can easily figure out the concentration because it is strong and completely dissociating. On the other hand, if we had a weak substance, which we'll, we'll, we'll look at an example, the weak substance is going to have an equilibrium expression. And because it has an equilibrium, we give it a K value, which is an equilibrium constant. Um, so they're saying, does the presence of a Ka or Kb value um, kind of give you a hint? And yeah, it does. So if you see a Ka or Kb, it's telling you this is something weak. And so that it is going to have a, an equilibrium reaction. And we'll, um, we're, we'll prob we're going to have to use an ice table. And we'll look at examples of that so it makes more sense. OK, the next example, we're going to do another calculate pH one. And it says, what is the pH of a 0 0.1 molar solution of, of NaF, sodium fluoride? And here we're given the Ka for um, hydrogen bound to fluorine. OK, so let's think about what we have here. So here we're told NaF. And we're told the Ka is for HF. Now, HF is an acid, and it's actually a weak acid. And if you were kind of, um, let's say you're on the exam and you kind of forgot, like, uh oh, is this a weak acid or not? One hint is that it has a Ka value, and that Ka value is really small, meaning that it's not dissociating that much. So that's a good hint that it's a weak acid. OK, so what is this weak acid's conjugate? The weak acid's conjugate base is F minus. Okay, and this NaF is actually a salt that can dissociate. Into the sodium and F minus. Okay, so here this since the salt completely dissociated. We know that the, co the concentration of conjugate base is 0 0.1 um, molar. But we're, we're being asked to solve for the pH of the solution. So how do I do this? So right now, um, understanding of salts can help you as well, which we'll review next. But I'll just kind of give you guys a little bit of knowledge in case you forgot. So sodium, um, that because it is the conjugate acid of a very strong base, sodium hydroxide, it actually does not contribute at all to pH. So we can completely ignore it for this problem. Um, on the other hand, because um, the fluoride ion is a conjugate base of a weak acid, it does have basic properties. And that is what we have in solution. And so we're going to use just the F minus to determine what the pH is. So we just know its concentration at this point. We want to know what is the pH of the solution. So this problem is just like having a conjugate base in solution and we're being asked to figure out the pH. So we want to show a reaction with the conjugate base. So we said anytime you have a weak base, you want to show it reacting with water and you want to give it an equilibrium reaction. Okay, on the right side, I'm going to protonate that base to get a weak acid. And then I'm going to deprotonate water. I'm going to get OH minus. So now this should look really familiar to us. We're looking at a weak base. Um, in water, and we know that it, its concentration is 0 0.1 molar. We're asked to solve for the pH here. Because this is a weak base and we have an equilibrium reaction, this is an example where we'd have to use an ice table. So we have an initial, we're going to look at the change, and then its final concentrations. And the reason for that is because when we look at those final concentrations, that's going to tell me the final concentration of hydroxide 
which we can then use the K expression to actually solve for that final concentration of hydroxide. And then we can solve for POH and then pH. Um, so people are asking about this salt. So you should just know that salts are going to fully dissociate. You guys never learned or went into any more detail than that. So just anytime you see a salt, it's going to completely dissociate. Okay, so now we have our um, initial concentration of our conjugate base. Anytime we're dealing with an ice table, we wanna ignore liquid. So I'm just gonna cross off for water. And we start with none of our products. Okay, so now in my ice table, I'm just gonna be paying attention to the coefficients. Here, everything has a coefficient of one. And remember, we're gonna put minus signs when we're uh, on the reactant side because we're getting rid of reactants and plus on the product side since we're forming products. So here we're gonna put minus X, plus X, and plus one X because it's just coefficient of one. And then when we just add that together, we get 0 0.1 minus X, X, and X. Now, again, here, what I'm really trying to solve for is X, which is my hydroxide concentration. And I can eventually then um, calculate pH using that. But at this point, I don't have enough to calculate pH. So now I know I can write a K expression for this reaction where I can then plug these in and I should be able to solve for X. So what K do I want to use here, though? Do I want to use KA or KB? Let's take a vote. A says we'll use KA, B says we should use KB expression. Okay, so the reason why we wanna use KB is because you're looking at a base reacting with water. So we wanna make sure that we're using KB. So that is somewhere where students would, um, some, some students would make a mistake on the exam. So make sure you're actually writing KB there because we're looking at a base reacting with water. And then just like any KB, we're gonna put products over reactants. So you're gonna put HF multiplied by the hydroxide concentration over F minus, and remember to not put water because it's a liquid. We don't wanna put any liquids or solids ever in any K expression. Okay, so now it's good. And we're gonna um, plug in what we have in our equilibrium row into our K, since the K is only interested in concentrations at equilibrium. So our HF is just X. The hydroxide concentration is X at equilibrium. And for F minus, it's 0.1 minus x. Okay, now what is our KB value? I don't have the KB value and I'm actually given KA. So this is an example where I'd have to solve for KB um, myself. So remember the equation is KW is equal to KA times KB. And to solve for KB, you would do KW over KA. Okay, the KW, remember that's a number we have to know, one times 10 to the negative 14. And then KA is what we were given here. Um, so the KA is specifically for this base that we're interested in for its conjugate acid. So that's the KA I need to use here. So it's conjugate acid is HF. And so we're gonna plug in 6.8 times 10 to the negative four. And I end up getting a KB value that's equal to 1.47 times 10 to the negative 11. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug that KB into the expression because it's going to help me solve for X. So on the top, we just have X squared. And then on the bottom, we have 0 0.1 minus X. Now we might be able to simplify this and get rid of this minus X, which will make um, this solving for X a lot simpler. And the way that we check to, if we can simplify that or not, is we'll take the initial concentration that we had of our base, so 0 0.1. Another way to think of it is you take the number that X is being added to or subtracted from. So that's 0 0.1. 
and divide it by the k um, that we're looking at. So in this case, 1.47 times 10 to the negative 11. And as long as that's greater than 100, we can make the simplification. And here, if you do that calculation, it is greater than 100. We're able to simplify and get rid of this minus x. OK, so because we're pretty much saying that because the Ka is so, so tiny, we have so little dissociation that this minus x, we can just ignore it completely. So now we're interested in solving for x. So we're going to do 0 0.1 times 1.47 times 10 to the negative 11. And that's going to equal x squared. So then we're going to take the square root and we'll be able to solve for x. And so here we get x is equal to 1.21 times 10 to the negative 6 moles per liter. Now, what does x tell me here that I'm interested in? So remember, I'm interested in pH, but x, um, according to this ice table, it tells me the hydroxide ion concentration. Okay, so now because I'm interested in pH though, um, I can again first solve for pOH and then solve for pH. So to solve for pOH, it'll just be negative log the hydroxide ion concentration, which we just solved for. So it's 1.21 times 10 to the negative six. Okay, when I plug that into my calculator, I'm going to get pOH is equal to 5.92. Then the last step, we just need to solve for pH. So you're going to use your equation pH plus pOH is equal to 14. Um, since we're interested in pH, that's 14 minus pOH. So pH is equal to 14 minus 5.92. And then our final answer, pH is equal to 8.08. And of course, that makes sense because we have a weak base in its solution. If I got a pH of two, I know my answer is wrong because this is just asking for the only thing in solution is weak base. So your, um, your answer has to make sense. That's a good way to just think about it on an exam. Okay, so pretty much what we were doing here was we were just um, given a concentration of our conjugate base and we had to fill an ice table because it's weak base and then using a KB value that we had to solve for, since we have a, a base reacting, um, we were then able to solve for X, which is our e equal to our hydroxide ion concentration. And that we just solve for pOH and then finally pH. Okay, so that's how you would do this other type of pH calculation, which is really good review. Um, so someone's saying, I thought it had to be greater than 400. I think it's Another prof might have said 400, but the prof I saw said 100, but I have seen um, it being written both ways, so it can be greater than 400, that's fine. But pretty much you're going to get some massive number when you try to do that simplification, and that's going to allow you to um, cross off that minus x. Okay, the next thing I wanted to review, and by the way, we're going to take a break um, at roughly like the hour mark, so halfway through the booklet. Okay, so the next thing I want to review is salts. So um, the first thing that we want to um, go over is just some understanding. And that is that a strong acid has very, very weak conjugate bases, whereas strong bases have very, very weak conjugate acids. Okay, so the stronger an acid is, the weaker its conjugate base. Okay, and if we are so we'll go into this and then we'll figure out how this is important for um, contributing to pH. So this is review, um, but I actually have seen a question of, on salts on each of the past midterms. So still is important to know. Um, so if we're looking at a salt, it can be broken down into two parts. So here's an example that we'll go through. Um, and the two parts is the anion, the negatively charged ion, and the cation, the positively charged ion. Okay, so for the anion, um, you want to look at each of them separately. So we'll, we'll first look at the anion and then the cation, doesn't matter what order. But in this case, I know that, um, so we'll just pause this example and go through these. So if you find, let's say we're looking at the cation and that is the conjugate acid of a strong base. Well, you know that because it's the conjugate acid of a very strong base, it's going to be very, very weak 
um, it's going to be a very, very weak conjugate acid, actually so weak that we can ignore its contributions to pH. Okay, now what if your cation was instead the conjugate acid of a weak base? So because it's a conjugate of a weak base, it's going to have some acidic properties and we have to um, consider its um, contributions to pH. So it's actually going to make the pH lower or more acidic. Okay, and this understanding is going to help you throughout this whole unit. Okay, what about when we're looking at the anion and we see that it's the conjugate base of a strong acid. So because it's the conjugate base of a strong acid, it means it's such a weak conjugate base and we can ignore its contributions to pH. Okay, um, if we instead have an anion that is the conjugate base of a weak acid, then that means this conjugate base has some basic properties. So it'll make the pH more basic or higher. Okay, now let's take a look at our example. So here on the um, CH3COO minus, the acetate ion is your anion, and then sodium is your cation. We want to look at each of those individually. I recognize the acetate ion as the conjugate base of this acid here, which is a weak acid. We know that wasn't one of the strong acids we had to memorize. Because it's the conjugate base of a weak acid, it means it does have some basic properties. Okay, so it's going to make the pH a little bit more basic. But we were interested in what the whole salt does. Is the salt basic, acidic, or neutral? And so in order to figure that out, we have to also consider the other ion, which in this case is sodium. So sodium, um, we can say that it's a conjugate acid of a strong base, sodium hydroxide. Okay, so um, when, when we think of sodium hydroxide, we know it's a strong base. So it's conjugate acid, sodium, got to be so, so weak that we can completely ignore it. So it has no acidic properties. Okay, so in total, you have um, an ion that slightly basic and then one that is not contributing to pH. So overall, you have a basic salt. So it's going to make the pH a little bit higher than seven. Okay, so again, just a reminder that you should be able to look at a salt just like we did and determine if it's acidic, basic or neutral for your exam. So now I have a practice question for us to go through. I'll give you guys um, a minute or two to think of this one on your own to see if you can apply what we just reviewed. Okay, so the answers are still coming in, but I'm gonna start taking this one up. So for this, you would again wanna look at each salt individually and figure out is each one acidic, basic, or neutral? And then you'll answer this question. And I saw a question kind of um, similar to this on a past midterm where they ask you like one of the above, two of the above, which I think sometimes um, students find those questions a little bit harder, um, but we'll go through um, one like that. So for the first salt, K, potassium and bromine. So the ions are K plus and Br minus. Okay, so we have to think, okay, well, K plus um, is the conjugate acid of something. So I've seen it in KOH. So it's the conjugate acid of a strong base. So because it's the conjugate acid of a strong base, it doesn't contribute to the pH. It's such a weak conjugate acid. So very weak, and it doesn't contribute to pH. For Br minus, the conjugate acid for it is HBr, okay? So this one was a little tricky, but you had to remember that HBr is a strong acid. So we can go back quickly just to remind ourselves of what those strong acids were in case we forgot. <clears throat> 
So HBr or hydrobromic acid was an example of a strong acid, okay? And that's why knowing that Br- is its conjugate base, that tells us that Br-, the bromide ion, is so weak that we can ignore its contributions to pH. Okay, so this is actually a strong acid, making this a very weak um, uh, conjugate base. So overall, we actually have a completely neutral salt. So this one is not one of the acidic salts. Um, the next one, NH4Cl, the two ions that it can break up into are NH4 plus, and Cl minus. Now NH4 plus is the conjugate acid of the base NH3. And this is a weak base. Okay, so it's the conjugate acid of a weak base, meaning that it does have some acidic properties. And what about Cl minus? Well, it's the conjugate base of hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid. Because it's a conjugate base of a strong acid, it means that it has, it's so, so weak that we can ignore its contributions to pH. So this one is very weak. So overall, you just have um, something that is contributing acidity. And so we have acidic salt here. So that is one acidic salt. Finally, for KCN, we have the two ions again here are potassium and cyanide. So potassium is the conjugate acid of KOH, which is a strong base. Because it's a conjugate acid of a strong base, that means that we can completely ignore um, its acidity. It's so weak. So this one is very weak. Okay. And then for um, CN minus, that is the conjugate base of a weak acid, HCN. Okay, so this is a weak acid. It's not one of the strong acids that we had to know. And so we know that it's a weak acid. And so its conjugate base is going to have some basic properties. It's going to be basic. So overall, this is a basic salt. Okay, so that's why the answer here was one of the above. One of them is an acidic salt. Okay. Hmm, that's a good question. Will Sunday session be recorded? I'll message that to Robbie in the break. I'm not entirely sure. Um, we'll go over this last page introduction to buffers before we take a break. And then we're going to go through a lot of different problems relating to buffers, since I know this is something that students often get really confused by. Okay, so what is a buffer, first of all? It just helps to have somewhat of an understanding of what it is before we go into these problems. So a buffer, it has, first of all, what is it made up of? It has um, a weak acid and its conjugate base or um, a weak base and its conjugate acid, okay? And what that allows it to do, which we'll soon see in problems, is that because it has both, of, let's go with that weak acid and conjugate base example, this is more commonly seen. So because it has, pretty much two weak components that are conjugates of each other, it can actually react with a strong acid or a strong base. So it has the ability to react with either of those, okay? And that is what makes a buffer so special because it can react with a strong acid or strong base. When, when we add those in limiting amounts, um, it's resisting large changes to pH. So just for understanding purposes, if you took hydrochloric acid, a super strong acid, you put it in a solution and you added more of it, let's say, um, the pH is gonna go down by so much. Where instead, if you have a buffer and you added some hydrochloric acid to that buffer, the pH is going to barely change because the buffer will completely react away that strong acid. Okay, so that is, um, what a buffer does. Um, so a quick question about salt. Someone is asking from before. Um, they're saying 
our salts always made up of a conjugate acid and conjugate base. And yes, each of the parts can be thought of, one of them's acting as a conjugate acid, one of them is thought of as a conjugate base. Um, so just figure out, is it a very, very weak conjugate um, base, which in this case for chloride, it was, um, because it was the conjugate base of a very strong acid. So we could ignore its properties and then consider is the conjugate acid actually acidic or do we ignore that as well for that type of problem? Okay, so back to buffers, we figured out, okay, what are the components? So it's a weak acid and it's conjugate base or weak base and it's conjugate acid. And its job is to resist large changes in pH or pOH by adding, um, when you add strong acids or strong bases to them. So this is a very common example of a buffer in this first equation here. So here we have our weak acid. And over here, we have our weak base. So right away, just notice that so far, nothing looks crazy, right? We just are looking at a weak acid um, and it's normal reaction that we're, that we're used to seeing. So it's just reacting with water. We have an equilibrium reaction because it's weak. And then we end up getting water protonated and the acid deprotonated. And so if we actually have both a weak acid and weak base present at the same time, we have a buffer. And we'll get into more details on that. Okay, so this picture is showing that we have a buffer. We have um, a weak acid and its conjugate base. And it's also showing that we want to have them in roughly equal amounts, which we'll um, touch a little bit on more on soon. But just know that roughly we want equal amounts. Um, that's, the, that's the ideal case, because that means we can react with um, strong acid, we can react with strong base, and we don't have to worry about running out of one of these components. Okay, so now we have our buffer. It's just there, that's great. But what we'll usually see in problems is that we might have strong base or strong acid reacted. So let's say that strong base is added to our buffer. This is what the scenario on the right is showing. So when strong base is added to the buffer, remember these are the two components of your buffer that are down here. Which of these components do you think the strong base would want to react with? The strong base wants to react with an acid. So it's going to want to react with the acid part of the buffer, which is your acetic acid here. And that's why then in the reaction, we're going to show the hydroxide ions from those strong base to react with the acid part of the buffer. And then here, notice that now we're going to put an arrow to the right. And this I'll summarize this below. And this is going to come in handy when we look at problems. But for now, we're just focusing on understanding. So the reason why we want to put an arrow to the right here, and not equilibrium, is because one of the substance reacting is strong. So because those hydroxide ions came from a strong base, it's going to push the reaction to the right. And that's why we have an arrow to the right. OK, and so this is the reaction that's occurring. That's all we'll look at now. So pretty much what's happening is, let's say you had, I'll just make up numbers. Let's say we started with five moles five moles, we had a buffer that originally had five moles of each of these. And let's say I just added one mole of a strong base. What's gonna happen is I'm gonna completely react that one mole of strong base. Okay, and in the end, you're still gonna be left with your weak acid part of the buffer and your weak base part of the buffer, it's conjugate base. And so that's what this is showing on the right. So we have less weak acid because it was used up, consumed to completely react with the strong base. And we have more um, conjugate base since we got more of that as a result of that reaction. Okay, but we still have a buffer because we still have roughly equal amounts of that conjugate acid and conjugate base. We haven't run out of one of those components. If we have, um, if we were to have like not roughly equal amounts or maybe we only have like a tiny bit of acid left and so much um, conjugate base, it's not gonna be considered a buffer anymore. And I'll show you the specifics of that soon. But for now, we're just going over understanding this reaction. So the next case we might see is that instead, when you have a buffer, um, we instead would react that with a strong acid. So it tells you, okay, you have this buffer and now strong acid is added. We have to be able to write out a chemical reaction to show that. So for the strong acid, um, we're gonna take the H plus or H3O plus ions from that strong acid. And now we wanna react to the component of the buffer. And so here for the strong acid, we're gonna react that um, with the conjugate base part of the buffer. So in this case, CH3COO minus, which is shown here. And then 
you're then going to get um, the, the H3O plus getting deprotonated, so you'd form water, and the conjugate base getting protonated, so you'd form that um, CH3COOH. Okay, and we'll look at problems. So this is assuming that we're adding a really, really tiny amount of strong acid. So again, it's going to get, we're going to completely get rid of that. Um, we'll have a little bit more less um, conjugate base present and a little bit more um, weak acid part of, um, present from the buffer. Um, but overall, we're still going to have a buffer and we were able to completely get rid of the strong acid that was reacted. Okay, so here are just um, a couple important notes that are really going to help us when we're looking at these problems and related to um, a couple student questions that I saw. So the first is that we saw examples of this. This is why we reviewed um, weak acids and bases in the reactions. But if you just have a weak acid or base on its own in solution, remember that we have it reacting with water and we're going to see an equilibrium reaction. Okay, so now we're familiar with these reactions. Um, and so in this ice table, if we were interested in, well, we saw a problem where we were interested in um, pH. Well, you'd have to solve for the H plus using your ice table and then pH. Okay, so just know that this ice table, when you're just dealing with a weak substance, the ice table has concentration. So you're going to put some initial concentration here, and that's how you would do this problem and go on. Okay, now it's a little bit different when we're reacting a strong substance with a weak substance, like we just talked about above. Okay, so in this case, let's react a strong basis hydroxide ions with a conjugate acid. When this happens, we said that, okay, this is a strong, from a strong base. We wanna put an arrow just going to the right, okay? And another thing, notice how I wrote moles here, because I wanna see how much moles do I have left over um, because that's gonna make the problems and calculations so much simpler. So we can just use moles in these ice tables. So we wanna make sure we're putting moles like I showed. So write in the moles, write in initial moles that you have, the change in moles, and then the end moles you have at the end of that reaction. And that's gonna be helpful if you're asked to determine now what is the pH, which is a very common question that we'll look at. Okay, so I think right now would be a good time to pause for a break and then we'll come back and finish the rest of the buffers um, part of this uh, booklet. Okay, so we'll pause, we'll, we'll, go, we'll come back um, in 10 minutes at um, 4.05. Let's come back at 4.05 p.m. Okay, so we're gonna get started again. Um, so we were talking about buffers and we just had an introduction to buffers. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the equations and then once we kind of go over all the different types of equations, we're then going to do a bunch of problems related to buffers. Okay, so this first equation is actually a main equation that we're gonna be using for buffers. It's called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And we have the pH of the solution or pH of the buffer solution equals to the pKa, so that's for your buffer. Um, so um, you'll be told, you know, an acid and its conjugate base makes up the buffer, and you'll most likely be given a Ka for that acid part of the buffer. So you just want to calculate the pKa and plug that in, since it's the pKa of the buffer itself. Okay, and so I'm just reminding us of these equations that we can use in order to solve for pKa. Um, and then you have the plus the log of the concentration of your conjugate base over the concentration of your acid. Or in other words, you're looking at the base part of the buffer over the acid part of the buffer. And remember that they're conjugates of each other. Okay, um, so this is a, um, a very helpful equation for us. So if we actually have um, the con concentrations of the base and acid part of the buffer, we can plug that directly in and you'll be given either the Ka or pKa of the buffer. So just convert that into pKa and you'll easily be able to solve for pH of the buffer using this equation. One thing I want to point out now, which we'll see in problems, is that you can use, when you're plugging in values, you can use concentrations or moles in this, in this equation. Oops. 
Okay, so you can use concentrations or moles. Just make sure that whatever one you use, you use the same for your conjugate base and acid, and that's going to help the units cancel out. Okay, so we'll see that we'll do that in different problems. Now, earlier we mentioned that um, for us to have a buffer, we want to have roughly equal amounts of the conjugate base and the acid part of the buffer. Um, and the reason for that is because when you have enough of both parts of the buffer, it means you're able to react with any strong acid that comes along or any strong base that comes along. So that's really ideal when we have the conjugate base and conjugate acid roughly equal. Now, if we look at the above equation, something happens when we let those two concentrations roughly equal one another. So let's say they actually are equal. So, um, when your conjugate base concentration is equal to the acid concentration for the buffer, what happens to the Henderson Hasselbalch equation? So you're going to get pKa plus log. Let's just say those concentrations are both equal to 10 moles per liter. So you have 10 over 10, you're going to get log of 1. Now it's just a rule, but log of 1 is just equal to 0. So you'll get pH is equal to pKa, since that um, crossed off. And this brings us another rule that's important to know for buffers. So we said that we, again, want um, roughly equal concentrations of conjugate acid and base. And when that happens, the pH of the solution is going to equal to the pKa of the buffer. So a common question on exams is, OK, the pH of the solution we want is, let's say, I don't know, two um, is a pH of two. What buffer should I use? And the one you want to use is the one that has a pKa um, very, very close to two. So within one pH unit up or down. Okay. So the reason why, again, is because when you have a pKa that's close to the pH or exact, then the concentrations of conjugate acid and base um, for the buffer are equal. And that's really, really ideal for a buffer. Okay, so that's how you can kind of understand what that means. So here that's just written out in words. You want the pKa of the buffer to be within one pH unit up or down of the pH of the solution. So an, an actual an example is um, if the pH of the solution is three, then you'd want to choose a pKa, a buffer with a pKa that either is, um, is uh, between two or four. OK, so it, if you take the pH and you add one, you get four. If you subtract one, you get two. So you want to choose a buffer in that range. And again, the reason why is because when the pKa is equal to or very close to the pH, that means you have um, uh, almost equal amounts of your conjugate acid and conjugate base, which is very favorable for a buffer because it means then it can react with strong acid or strong base that we react, that we add into the reaction. Another equation that you guys looked at was this one. And this, we, we mentioned that we for a buffer, we want the weak acid and the conjugate base to be roughly equal. And so this is just being a little bit more specific. So um, yeah, we want them to be roughly equal, but how do we decide when it's no longer a buffer? And so the way we would do this is if we plug them into this equation and we get something outside of this range. So for example, if I plug into this equation and I get, um, 15. So when I um, take the concentration of weak base of my buffer over the concentration of its conjugate acid, and I get 15, then I'm outside of the range of a buffer. So anything outside of this range is actually not a buffer. Even if you have weak base and weak acid present, if, it, if the amounts are way too different, like you have way too much of one and way too little of the other, it's not considered a buffer. So if it's greater than here, it's not a buffer. Or if you have some smaller number, it's not a buffer. OK, so a question I saw on a past exam said something like, um, which of the following changes makes this, um, makes this reaction exceed the buffer's capacity? And so that pretty much is saying that it, the buffer's capacity has been exceeded, meaning it's no longer a buffer. So it's asking. Now, when you calculate weak base over weak acid, um, for which of those options do you get something that's no longer a buffer? So something outside of this range. 
Okay, the last thing I want to go over is again, this, this is the Henderson Hasselbalch equation we already looked at, which we should be really familiar with. We want to be, make sure we're really familiar with this one. We also may see another version of that equation. That's what I'm showing above. So it's just the base version of that same equation. I'll go over it. You don't have to know this equation or um, use it at all. You can actually get by with just using the bottom one. Um, and I'll explain how. So sometimes if you have a basic buffer, um, you can use the top equation where you have instead of pH, you have pOH. Instead of pKa, you have pKb. And then um, instead of the conjugate base over the acid, you're still going to put your conjugate, but it's here because we're the main thing we're interested in is a base. The conjugate is an acid. So you're going to make sure you put the acids concentration over the bases for this um, reaction using when you're using this equation. Now, you can always use this main henderson hasselbalch equation. So that's why that one's in a box. You will never go wrong using it. Just make sure that you're plugging in the correct values. You're actually plugging in pKa, you're plugging in pH, and you're making sure you put the bases concentration over the acids if you want to use this equation. And something I did see on a past midterm one um, was where students just had to, they were given options A, B, C, D, and each one had a different weird equation and one of them was the correct equation. So you just can familiarize yourselves with this in case you see a similar question. Okay, so if it's, no matter whether you're looking at the acid or base version, it's always gonna be the conjugate on the top and then the, um, the thing that's not the conjugate. So for our acid equation, we're looking at the conjugate base and then over the acid. Okay, and we'll, we're gonna use this equation since it's just so much easier and way more commonly used. Um, so one thing about this equation, we already mentioned that we can use this equation to solve for the pH of a buffer. And we're also gonna look at problems and you could see one of these on your exam where instead of asking you to solve for pH, they ask you to solve for something else. And we'll look at how to do that. So you might be asked, let's say to solve for the concentration of conjugate base, you have all the other variables and we'll look at how we can solve for that using this henderson hasselbalch equation. So when you think about buffers, I really want you guys to think about this equation because a lot of the time, a problem involves using this in some way or at some point in the question. Okay, so for the first question, we have um, a buffer is formed by dissolving five grams of sodium benzoate and six grams of benzoic acid. The Ka is given for the acid and one liters of water. What is the pH of this buffer? Okay, so right away, okay, I'm, I know what we're talking about a buffer. It's asking me for pH. I should think right away, okay, I need the henderson hasselbalch equation. So I'm just gonna write that out for us. Then we can see what we have, what we don't have and what we need to do. Okay, so the conjugate base concentration on top and then the acids concentration. So here I'm being asked to solve for pH. Um, I would need to, to have pKa in order to solve for that. I see that I do have Ka, so I can use this equation, pKa. Is equal to negative log Ka and I'll be able to solve for the pKa, so that's fine. And then the concentration or remember moles I can use for the conjugate base over the conjugate acid. So how should I do that part of the question? Well, on the left, I have sodium um, benzoate. And so that's a salt and that's gonna completely dissociate into sodium. It's a metal and some other component. So that's kind of how you can remember that it's a salt. It's gonna completely dissociate into these components. Okay, and and then benzoic acid is your um, acid part of the buffer. Okay, so here we know it's a buffer again. It tells us that, but we also know because we have a weak acid and its conjugate base, which I'll circle for us. These are the components of the buffer. Okay, so now I have to figure out: should I put in concentrations or moles? So here, because I'm, I'm I've seen that I'm. I've been given grams, it's probably gonna be easier for me to solve for moles and just plug those mole values in. So we are told that we have five grams of sodium benzoate. So the mass is five grams for this compound here. 
And I want to solve for moles so I can eventually solve for the moles of the conjugate base. So I'll first solve for the molar mass of sodium benzoate. So I already did that for you guys to save us some time. Um, so we have the molar mass is 144.11 grams per mole. So to solve for moles, you're going to do N is equal to little m over big M. So the mass on the top over your molar mass. And you're going to end up with units now with moles. And so you'll get 0 0.03470 moles. And that's for your conjugate base. Sorry, that's for sodium benzoate. Now we're interested in moles of the conjugate base. And so because of this reaction, we can see that um, there's a one-to-one -one ratio between sodium benzoate and our conjugate base that we're interested in, benzoate. And so this is also going to be equal to the moles of the conjugate base, which I'll just write A minus. Okay, now I have to do the same thing, but figure out the moles of the acid part of the buffer. So for the acid, we have a mass of six grams. The molar mass of the acid is 122.12 grams per mole. So I can again solve for moles using mass over molar mass. So you're going to do 6 grams over 122.12 grams per mole. And you're going to get 0.04913 moles. And this is again for our acid part of the buffer. Okay. So now we just have to plug those mole values in, solve for pKa, plug everything in, and we'll be able to solve for the pH of the buffer. Okay, so first let's go ahead and solve for pKa before we plug everything in. So the pKa is just negative log our Ka, which is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 5. And so the pKa we'll get here is... I have to calculate that. Four point one eight. Okay, so now I'm just going to fill in the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. So I'm solving for pH. I just solved for pKa. It's four point one eight plus log. We said we can use moles instead of concentrations. Just make sure you're plugging both of them in as moles so the units cancel out. So we're putting the moles of the base on top. Don't forget that. So it's going to be zero point zero three four seven zero over 0 0.04913, the units of moles will cancel out. Um, so when you're doing this, you can first do the fraction I would recommend to so do 0 0.03470, divide it by the 0 0.049, and then do log of that number and then add 4.19. Okay, so pH you'll get is um, 4.03. Okay, so that's a nice simple problem how we would use this equation to just solve for the pH of a buffer. Okay, so we're literally just using the Henderson Hasselbalch equation and we realize we can just use moles of each of the conjugate base and the acid part of the buffer. Let's try another problem now. Okay, so this one I want you guys to try now. It says based on the given ionization constants, which of the following pairs of substances should be dissolved together in water to produce a buffer with a pH of 9.85 and you're given some options. So I'm gonna give you guys about a minute to think about this and then I'll take it up. <laughs> 
Okay, so let's see how to do this problem. And this is one that um, is, you could expect to see something like this on your exam, a little bit um, tricky, but let's see how you guys did. So it says, based on the given ionization constants, which of the following pairs of substances, again, could be dissolved to form a buffer with a specific pH? Okay, now here we're given a bunch of different components, Ka values and Kb values, and we're given um, the pH of the solution that we're trying to get at. And what we have to remember is we said that when we're choosing a buffer, the key here for this question is that we had to remember that the pH of the solution, we want that to be equal to the pKa of the buffer. And again, that's because when you look at the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, when, you, when these two are equal, it means that the conjugate base and conjugate acid concentrations are equal to one another, which is ideal for a buffer. Okay, so what's ideal for us is if we let those conjugate acid um, and base concentrations equal one another, pH is equal to pKa. So this is what you're going to use to choose a buffer. So the first thing you had to do was realize, okay, we have Ka's and I need to solve for pKa. So the equation to, to, to um, use to solve for pKa is pKa is equal to negative log Ka. Now you could have solved for each one of those pKa's. So when I did that for the first one, you got pKa is equal to 4.74. For the next one, I got pKa is 10.32. Third one, 6.35. So I'm just plugging in the Ka values for each of them to solve for their pKa values. Um, the next one, 4.72, and the next one, 3.17. So based on those, right away, you should be able to say, okay, what do you want your acid part of the buffer to be? So the one that was in, um, remember, it can be, it doesn't have to exactly be 9.85. It can be um, within a range of take add one pH unit and subtract one pH unit. So it can be in a range of two pH units from 8.85 to 10.85. And so the answer then, the acid part of the buffer that follows that is bicarbonate because its pKa was 10.32, which falls in that range. So that's your, that was your best answer, okay? But this question wanted you to take a step further and, it's, and even if you knew it was bicarbonate, you may have still got this question wrong because it's saying, okay, which um, uh, which buffer, which of these options should you choose? So we know that we want it to be bicarbonate. That is going to be your acid part of the buffer. So I'm going to write that here. HCO3 minus is our acid part of the buffer. And for a buffer, you need its conjugate base. So that means we need to deprotonate this and consider what its conjugate base is. So the conjugate base, when you deprotonate this, you're going to get CO3 2 minus. So that is the conjugate base. And this is the buffer that you'd wanna use. So this is your answer. Now we just have to find an option that matches that. So A is talking about a completely different acid. We know that's wrong. Um, B, we're gonna um, skip for now because I can see that it looks kind of similar, but I'm not exactly sure, let's say, so I'll skip it. C also looks kind of like that, so I'll skip it for now. And D looks like a completely different acid. Shouldn't have the CH3COOH in it. So now if you're trying to determine from B and C, um, you won't see right now what they've done is they've just bound it to sodium in this solution because you wouldn't ever have like an ion on its own. So here they're showing you, okay, with sodium bound to it, what is your answer? So if you bind this to sodium, it's going to be NaHCO3 and this one would be Na. 2CO3 because the sodium had plus one charge, the, ki the carbonate had a two minus charge. So it, the two went to the sodium and the one went to the carbonate. And so now we can see that this answer best matches C. So this is actually your answer. And that is the buffer um, that would be ideal to produce a solution with a pH of 9.85 because this buffer has a pKa of 10.32, which is very, very close to that pH that we're interested in. D e is not also not a good answer because H2CO3 is a different acid than HCO3 minus. Um, so H2CO3 is carbonic acid and that one is not the correct answer.
So that's another way you could have also eliminated B. Okay, so good job. The answer was C there. The next question is also um, commonly kind of seen and tested on. So we'll take a look. It says, how many moles of sodium acetate should be added to 700 milliliters of a 0 0.15 molar solution of acetic acid to get a pH of 4.8? Assume no volume change and the pKa is 4.75. Okay, so at first you might be like, what the heck do I do with this question? I'm not sure if you see this on your exam. So you can just think of what are the different components that you're given here? Okay, so um, here we have sodium um, acetate. We know that's a salt. So it can dissociate into sodium plus and the acetate ion. Okay, and we're interested in its moles. And we also are told that we have this acid, and we have a certain volume of it, a certain concentration, and we want to pretty much react those together to get a pH of 4.8. Okay, and we're also told the pKa. So now after we kind of thought about the different elements we have, it kind of sounds like a buffers problem. And even if you didn't think about buffers, because you have pH and pKa, it should help you think about the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So what's happening here is this is a buffers problem because you have an acid part of the buffer and you have its conjugate base, right? And when you have an acid and its conjugate base, you can form a buffer. And so here, let's write out the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation and see how we could maybe use that to solve for this. So it's going to be pH is equal to pKa plus log the conjugate base on the top over the acid. Okay, so it, um, we, we're told the pH, so that's fine. We're told the pKa. And now here, I'm not sure what to do, let's see. So um, for the acid, we have, okay, a concentration. And for the base, we're being asked to solve for moles. So it actually might be easier, since we can use moles or concentrations in this problem, as long as we use the same unit, it might be easier to just use moles for both. Okay, so if we plug in moles for both, in this problem, by plugging in moles of my acid and the other values, I'll be able to solve for moles of the conjugate base. And then once I figure out moles of the conjugate base, um, in this case, that's going to actually equal to the moles of the sodium bound to that conjugate base because there's a one to one molar ratio. Okay, so the first step is we're going to have to solve for the moles of our acid. So N is equal to C times V is the equation that we're going to use to solve for moles. You're going to take your concentration with units moles per liter, so 0 0.15. And remember that, so here I'll just rewrite that so we can understand it. This is moles per liter, so it makes sense that we're going to have to multiply that to a volume in liters. Okay, so to get a volume in liters, you divide by 1,000. So here you'd get 0 0.7 liters um, as your volume. Okay, so we're going to plug that volume in. And now this is going to help me solve for the moles of the acid part of the buffer, the weak acid. And so you're going to get 0 0.105 moles. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plug in all the values that we have. We, we are trying to get a pH of 4.8. We're given a pKa of 4.75. We're going to use moles for both of these, which is um, good because now I can solve for moles of the conjugate base. So I'm just going to leave that in as the conjugate base. And I'm going to plug in the moles of the acid that I just solved for, which is 0 0.105 moles. Okay, so let's do the easy part of the problem first. Let's just move this 4.75 over to the left side of the equation. So because we um, cha changed the side that it's on, um, on the equal sign, we change the side of the equal sign that it's on, we're going to change its sign. So we're doing 4.8 minus 4.75 is equal to log of that conjugate base, moles in this case, over this moles. So on the left side, you're just going to get 0 0.05. And then I'll just rewrite the right side. 0.05 
Okay, now at this point, what do we do? So when you have a log of something, there's like a hidden 10 um, in between here. And what I can actually do to get rid of the log is on the other side of the equation, I can take 10 to the exponent of 0 0.05. So if I do that, I've now gotten rid of the log on the right side. So now I just have A minus over 0 0.105 moles. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is just take 10 to the power of 0 0.05, whatever that number is, and multiply it by 0 0.105 moles. And that's actually going to tell me the moles of my conjugate base. Okay, so when I multiply those two numbers together, I got the moles of my conjugate base is equal to um, 0 0.12. Okay, now this question is not asking for moles of your conjugate base. It wants to know how many moles of sodium acetate. And here we mentioned that, okay, we just figured out moles here is 0 0.12. Because there's a one-to-one -one ratio, one-to-one -one molar ratio in this equation, we just actually figured out the answer. So the moles of sodium acetate is also 0 0.12 moles. Okay, so this is another example of a problem where we use the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. Here we, we um, use mole values. We plugged in the other values and we were able to solve for moles of the conjugate base and then moles of the salt that they were interested in. Why? Let me see the question. So someone's asking about phenol. So when I solve for the pKa there, I got 9.88, which would have also been a good solution, um, but just none of the options had that. So we just couldn't go with that. Okay, so because this pKa um, was equal to the pH, that would have also been fine. Um, but the, the here, the out of the answer options, the one that matched was um, you could use HCO3 minus as your acid and CO3 two minus as the base part of this buffer. Good question. Um, so someone's asking for the Henderson Hasselbach equation, can you always use moles? And yes, you actually can. Um, so you can always either plug in both, both of those values can be moles or both of those values have to be in concentrations. Okay, let's try this next problem. So this one says, calculate the pH of the solution that results from the addition of, so they wanted to, to calculate pH and we're gonna add 10 milliliters and this much concentration of sodium hydroxide to this many milliliters with this much concentration of HCN and we're given a Ka value. Okay, so at first it might seem a little confusing, but let's just write out the values that we know for each of these um, substances that are reacting together. So we have sodium hydroxide and we have this HCN acid. Okay, so for sodium hydroxide, um, the volume is 10 milliliters. The concentration is 0 0.10 molar. And for the acid, we have a concentration of 0 0.1 and we have a volume and we're also given its Ka for that acid. Okay, so um, what can I, what do I know about how these two will react? Um, so first of all, sodium hydroxide, what is that? A base, an acid. So we know it's base. We also know it's a strong base. So sodium hydroxide is actually going to react to completely dissociate into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. Okay, so because it's um, a strong base, whatever concentration or moles you have of sodium hydroxide is going to be equal to the concentration or moles for hydroxide ion. Okay, so we'll just keep that in mind. And now we're being told to react these two things together. So we have to write out, or we should always write out a chemical reaction to show this. Okay, so here, um, this is using our knowledge of buffers. We'll see how, but Remember we talked about how um, we can react a strong substance with a weak substance. So here, 
the this is the strong base, but this is a weak acid. And so here we're going to react those two together. So if I take the weak acid, okay, what I'm going to put in that chemical reaction, what it's actually going to react with from the strong base are those hydroxide ions, just like we saw earlier. And now because there's a strong substance in this chemical reaction, we're going to make this completely go to the right. Okay. And so now let me just fill out the rest of the chemical reaction. We had an acid, it's going to get deprotonated to form C and minus. And we have a hydroxide ion that's going to get protonated to form water. Okay, great. And so now, okay, let me think about what we can do here. Well, it says calculate the pH. So how would I do that? So here, first of all, what did we mention? Whenever you have a strong substance reacting with a weak substance, we said, okay, first of all, you want the arrow going to the right. Second of all, when we have an ice table, we said we'd want to plug in moles. So if we need an ice table, we're gonna plug in moles. So here, would that be helpful to us? So let's see. Well, if I figure out the moles of the acid and the moles of the, the base, or specifically the moles of the hydroxide that I'm interested in, is, is what I'm interested in, and I plug in both of those moles values, what I can see is what do I end up with at the end? And then based on what I have at the end, I can then figure out, okay, how do I calculate pH? Okay, so the process, process will be different depending on what we have at the end. Let's say we only have hydroxide ion at the end, then we can solve for its concentration, we can solve for pOH, then pH. If I only have this um, weak acid at the end, I would have to then consider how it reacts with water and then figure out the pH. So there's kind of different ways that um, we can go about this depending on what we are left with. But first, let's figure out moles of each of these, plug in the moles, and then see what we're left with, and then we can solve for pH. Okay, so step one is we're going to solve for moles of each. So remember that moles is N is equal to C times V. And remember that we also want to always be using volume in liters. Okay, so divide the milliliter values by 1,000 to get liters. Okay, so when you do this, you're going to get um, 0 0.05 liters here. 0.01 liters there. So when you solve for moles, 0 0.1 times 0 0.05, you're gonna get five times 10 to the negative three moles of the acid, the weak acid. Now this is what you initially had for that weak acid. So I'm gonna put it into the ice table. Okay, now let's do the same thing for the base. So for sodium hydroxide, again, we're gonna solve for its moles. So N is equal to C times V, which is equal to 0 0.1 molar times 0 0.01 liters. So I end up getting um, um, one times 10 to the negative three moles for the base. Okay, so that's moles of sodium hydroxide. And again, if we look at how sodium hydroxide dissociates, I know that because I have one times 10 to the negative three moles of sodium hydroxide, I'm gonna have an equal number of moles for the hydroxide ion because there's a one-to-one -one molar ratio and it completely dissociates, okay? So that's how many moles I start with in this reaction. So I'm reacting with one times 10 to the negative three moles of hydroxide. Now we, we haven't been told anything about cyanide and we can just ignore waters and, and water in any of these ice tables. So we'll just cross that out just to make it a little simpler. And we're gonna start with zero amount of cyanide. So now because we're dealing with moles, we wanna um, get rid of whatever is um, what we have in a smaller amount. So let's look at both these numbers, five times 10 to the negative three and one times 10 to the negative three. One times 10 to the negative three is the smaller number. So I'm gonna get rid of those moles completely I'm gonna also get rid of that on this side because this is a reactant. So we're gonna subtract that amount. And then now for the cyanide, I'm going to add that amount of moles. Okay, so now what we have is we actually have no more hydroxide in this case. We, we have a small amount of hydroxide. We've completely gotten rid of it all. And we have no more hydroxide. And so um, for HCN, when you do five times 10 to the negative three minus one times 10 to the negative three, you get left with four times 10 to the negative three moles. Okay, that's nice. And for cyanide, we have one times 10 to the negative three moles. Okay, so now what do we have at the end? We have no more strong base. 
we have a weak acid and it's conjugate base. So think about how you might solve for pH here. So here, um, this should ring some bells when you have a weak acid and it's conjugate base, you actually have a buffer. Okay, and so we can actually use the Henderson Hasselbalch equation and solve for pH using that. So this was our first kind of major step. So actually that was step three. Once we solve for moles, we wrote out our chemical reaction and we figured out, okay, what are the end moles that we have? Once we have that, we can say, okay, how do I solve for pH now? In this case, we had a weak acid and its conjugate base. And we know that those values of moles can be plugged directly into the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. So we have pH is equal to pKa plus log of the conjugate base over acid. Okay, so what's nice about this equation is again, you don't have to use concentrations in here. If you have moles already, just save yourself some time and plug moles in directly. So we're again going to use moles for both of these. So let's see if I'm able to solve for pH, which is what this question wants me to solve for. I have moles of the conjugate base, one times 10 to the negative three. I have moles of my um, weak acid part of the buffer. And how do I solve for pK again, well, pKa, where do I get that? So the pKa, you're gonna take from this Ka of the HCN part of the buffer. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna solve for pKa using the equation pKa is equal to negative log Ka. So someone's saying, do we always use moles um, with, when we're using this equation and buffers? So we might not always, but in this type of problem, I would definitely recommend it because it's already in moles for you. But for example, if let's say we were dealing with a completely different problem that instead gave you concentrations, that's when I would just plug in the concentration values. So you can just see what would be easiest for you depending on what you're given. So here, values were already in moles. We can just plug in the mole values. So someone's asking, is there another way to do this without the henderson hasselbalch equation? Um, let me think. So there is another way, but it's way more complicated and it would take like 10 minutes just to explain, but I can kind of just show you a little bit. And um, so the way that you would do this is um, you have a, a, a weak acid left over and a weak base left over. And so you could show how this acid reacts in water and then write a Ka expression and that way is just way too kind of messed up here. There's no reason to do that because for that way in Ka, when you're plugging any values into Ka, you need concentrations. And so um, it's gonna be trickier to solve for the concentrations here. So there's no need to even go down that path. Just use this um, equation, it's much simpler because you're able to plug in the values of moles that we have here. Okay, so um, if we go ahead and solve for pKa, you have negative log the Ka, which is 4.9 times 10 to the negative 10. So the pKa that you're going to get is um, 9.31 for this problem. Okay, so we're interested in pH. We're gonna plug in our pKa, 9.31. We're gonna take the moles of the conjugate base, one times 10 to the negative three moles over the moles of the acid, four times 10 to the negative three. And so here we can actually just plug that right in and we're able to solve for pH and you're gonna get a pH of 8.71. So I'll just quickly summarize what we did for this problem. Since I think if a lot of students saw this on the exam, they might get like, might be, might be confused of what to do. So first we realize, okay, we have a strong base and a weak acid. We have to show a chemical reaction reacting those two together. So I said, okay, you have a strong substance, show an arrow to the right. And another tip I gave was that anytime you have a strong substance in that ice table, you want to use moles. Then we were able to get rid of whatever we had in limiting amount we ended up having no more strong base and we only had a weak acid and its conjugate base in moles. So the easiest way to solve for pH was just plug that into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation and we, got, we were able to solve for the pH.
Okay, so someone's asking, what happens if OH was left over? Let's say we had 7 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of hydroxide. So you have no more of the um, acid and you, you have the conjugate base as well. So when you have strong base and conjugate base, um, what you're going to do is you're going to just ignore the conjugate and just look at the strong base. So you're going to say, okay, I have this many moles of, of hydroxide ions. That's more important in determining pH. You're then going to figure out its concentration, and then you're going to figure out the um, pOH and then pH. Okay, so to figure out if you just have hydroxide ions left over, um, to figure out its, its concentration, I'll just quickly make a note of that here. So if you only a if only OH was left over, you need its concentration because when you're trying to solve for pOH. You need the OH minus concentration here. You can't just solve, you can't plug in moles for that equation. Okay, so what you would do, um, you would use N is equal to CV to solve for concentration. And so you would do N over V. So we already have whatever moles of the hydroxide that you have left over. And then for the volume is a little tricky part, you're gonna put the total volume. So because two of these things reacted together, the total volume is 10 milliliters plus 50 milliliters, and you're going to convert that into liters. And now you have your OH minus concentration, plug that in to get pOH and then pH. Okay. Um, in the midterm prep, I'm going to go over that uh, summary regarding those other equations too. But here, I just want to go over this one because this one is tricky. And if you can understand this, you can understand a lot of the problems that you're going to see. So um, for this ice table, we had to use moles because there's a strong substance in this equation. So because of that, this came from a strong base, but we, we have to use moles in this ice table, okay? And then we just plugged in those values that we had left over of our conjugate base and our acid into the henderson hasselbalch equation. Okay, so we're on our last two pages. So we'll just finish these two pages and then that'll be the end of our session. The last thing I wanted to go over is you'll commonly see questions asking, was a buffer formed as a result of this reaction, right? And we kind of did a question like that and we'll revisit that question to make sure we understand it. Um, but let's, let's go through this. So we mentioned that um, ideally we want the weak base part of the buffer and its conjugate acid to be roughly equal. And then we have a, a buffer. Um, but if we're being more specific, if we do this calculation and we get something in this range between 0 0.1 and 10, we know for sure we have a buffer. So that's a way we can check to see if we have a buffer or not. Okay. So here I'm just going over understanding with you guys. So this is showing, let's just say we're reacting a strong acid and a weak base together. So um, you could also write it like H3O plus reacting with the strong base. Um, and then here you would write water. So that's another way people write it. But let's just um, go through this example. So in the first example, we're reacting an equal amount of strong acid and um, weak base. So because we, react, and again, one of them is strong. So we know that the arrow is going to go to the right. And we know that the ice table is going to have moles in it. So let's just, I made up numbers. Let's say we start with one moles of each of these. I'm gonna completely react and get rid of that one mole, one mole. And here I'm gonna have plus one mole and plus one mole. So in the end, I have no more of these guys, but I do have um, this and this. Now we talked about how chloride is not gonna contribute to pH because um, it is the conjugate base of a strong acid. So we're not, uh, if we're asked to solve for pH, we don't have to consider that. Um, but if we're asked to solve for pH, we then would look at NH4 plus and see how much we have left over and calculate pH based on that. But here, this question is just saying, do we form a buffer here? So here, we're not going to form a buffer because when you look at the end, in order to have a buffer, you need to have both the weak um, acid and its base present. So you would need this base and its acid, its conjugate acid present at the end in order to have a buffer. And not only present, but also when you plug in their concentrations, they have to fall in this range. And that's how you know for sure you have a buffer. Here, I have no more of the weak base. I definitely do not have a buffer if you were asked this on your test. 
Okay, next, let's consider if now we have more strong acid reacting. So let's say two moles and one mole. If we get rid of the one mole, since that's a limiting amount, I produced one mole of these, I'm left with um, a strong acid and a weak acid. Okay, so here, um, could I form a buffer? So again, I can't form a buffer because in order to form a buffer, I need to have uh, the conjugate acid and its conjugate base present, but here I actually have no more base. There's um, no more base part of the buffer left, so I can't possibly have formed a buffer. Okay, and the final example, when you react with a limiting amount of strong substance, um, here it's showing that it's just one mole. You get rid of that one mole, get rid of that one mole on the reactant side and add that one mole on the product side. So here, if we were asked, do we form a buffer? You see that you have one mole of the base and one mole of the conjugate acid. And so here you do have both components of the buffer. You have a base and it's conjugate acid in this case. And so you are able to form a buffer. Okay, if let's say there, um, let's say we were in a one liter solution. So the volume is one liters. Then you can solve for each of these concentrations by just doing C is N over V. So you have just one mole over one liter. So the concentration is one molar. So this concentration is one molar, this concentration is one molar. Um, if you needed to solve for concentrations, because then you could check in this equation here whether you actually have a buffer. So here, I just made up an example where you have one molar over one molar, and notice how you're getting an answer of one, which is within that range. And that's how we can confirm that yes, a buffer is formed. So this one, a buffer is formed because you have a weak substance and it's conjugate. Okay, so now let's look at a problem um, that could that could be seen on your exam that's um, asking you if a buffer is formed from the described reaction. Okay, so it says 100 milliliters of this concentration solution of nitric acid was added to this many milliliters of this concentration solution of sodium benzoate. And we're told the conjugate base, uh, it's the conjugate base of benzoic acid and we're given the Ka value for that. Part one, is a buffer formed from this reaction? So that sounds like a lot of information at first. I always want you guys to consider what is the reaction that's occurring first? Okay, so I have nitric acid. What type of acid is that, by the way? Is that strong or weak? So nitric acid is an example of a strong acid. Okay, and then I have um, benzoate which is a conjugate base of benzoic acid, a weak acid. So this means that this base is a weak base. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're taking um, nitric acid, which because it's strong, right, we can dissociate that into H plus and NO3 minus. Okay, and the reaction that's occurring is between the strong acids, H plus ions, and the weak base, the conjugate base. So let's react those two together. So our base is C6H5COO minus, right? That's a salt and it's going to dissociate into Na plus and this ion. Okay, now this base is going to react with the strong acid that we're reacting it with. It's going to react with the H3O plus ions from that strong acid. Because it's from a strong acid, we're going to go all the way to the right and then we'll see what the products are. So for this um, weak base, we're going to protonate that to get the benzoic acid. And then our H3O plus will deprotonate that to get water. Okay, what now because we're reacting um, a weak substance with a strong substance, we said the arrow is going to go to the right and our ice table is going to have moles. So what we'll need to do is we'll need to figure out moles of each of these and see what we have left over and then we'll vote on if a buffer um, is formed or not. Okay, so I need to figure out moles of each. So for nitric acid, the volume is 100 milliliters, which is 0 0.1 liters, and the concentration is 0 0.5 molar. The moles, remember the equation is for, is for moles, is N is equal to C times V. So the moles is 0 0.5 molar times 0 0.1 liters. And the moles for nitric acid that you should get 
is 0 0.05 moles. Okay, now again, because we're interested in putting H plus or H3 plus ions in our reaction, we know that the amount of moles we have of nitric acid based on this reaction here, you're going to get the same number of moles of the H plus or H3O plus. So we just solve for the initial amount of H3O plus moles, which is 0 0.05 moles. Okay, now we can also solve for the moles of the conjugate base. So that comes from sodium benzoate. And we're told that for sodium benzoate, So for sodium benzoate, um, we have volume is 75 milliliters, concentration is 0 0.37 molar. Okay, so the volume is 0 0.075 liters. You get liters by again, taking your milliliter value, dividing it by a thousand. And then we can solve for moles here, C times V. So 0 0.37 molar times 0 0.075 liters. So the moles for sodium benzoate I get are um, 0 0.02775 moles, okay? Now we don't wanna put in sodium benzoate, it's just easier if we put the actual um, weak base. So we know that the way that this dissociates is it dissociates into sodium ions, and C6H5COO minus ions. So they have, again, it's a salt, it's gonna completely dissociate. And so we have the same number of moles of sodium benzoate, I'm oh, sorry, of just the benzoate ions. So I'm gonna put those moles in the ice table. Okay, now the acid, we're, it's not mentioned that we start with any of that. And for water, we can just completely ignore water in any ice table. That's why I like to put the H3O plus in the reaction because then its conjugate is water. It's just nice and easy to ignore that. Okay, next we have to figure out what is the limiting um, amount of moles here. So I have less moles of the 0 0.02775, which is the um, base, the weak base. So I'm gonna subtract that amount of moles and also subtract it from the other reactant and then add it to the product side. Okay, so you end up with um, none weak, no more weak base. You end up with 0 0.02225 moles of the strong acid and 0 0.02775 moles of that. Vote A for yes, a buffer is formed, and vote B for no, a buffer is not formed. And then we'll take it up. Okay, let's see what you guys said. Okay, so let's see how, you, how would you get this answer? So um, we have to look at what do we have at the end? In order to have a buffer, you need to have an acid and its conjugate base or a base and its conjugate acid. Now the um, base and the conjugate acid are the, these two components. And I see that at the end, I have no more of the base. I only have the weak acid. Therefore, I do not have a buffer. Um, I would need to have a certain amount of um, the conjugate base in order to have a buffer. Here, I know that because I have none of the conjugate base, I know I can't have a buffer. Okay, so the answer was B, that there is no buffer that was formed here. Okay, now the part two says, what is the pH of the resulting solution? So this kind of relates to the questions you guys were asking. How do we now solve for pH if we're asked? So let's try that. So here, what you have to do is you have to look at, after the reaction took place, what do you have left? So in this case, we have H3O+, which is from a strong acid and a weak acid. 
Now I said that if you have a strong and weak um, acid or a strong and weak base, you're gonna ignore the weak thing because it's not gonna contribute to pH very much. And what we're just gonna focus on is the strong substance. So here I'm gonna determine pH just from looking at the strong acids leftover moles. Okay, so I know that the strong acid moles of H3O plus are equal to 0 0.02225, okay? How can I solve for pH? So I know that there's an equation pH is equal to negative log H plus, and I can use that to solve for pH. Just one problem is that here I have the moles of H plus. I need to figure out its concentration first. Okay, so I have moles of H plus. I need its concentration. So what I'll wanna do is use the equation N is equal to C times V. Again, this is for H plus. I'm trying to figure out what is the concentration of H plus so I can plug it into that pH equation. So since I'm interested in solving for concentration, you're gonna do C is equal to N over V. We know it's moles. And now here, what is the volume? So because again here, we're, we reacted two different things together and we have a final scenario. The new volume is the total volume. And that's what you need to consider when you're trying to figure out pH, okay? So you, we took 75 milliliters of the sodium benzoate and 100 milliliters of the strong acid. So our total volume is 175 milliliters. If we divide that by a thousand, we get liters, which is 0 0.175 liters. So in our final scenario, we have that many moles of our strong acid, um, that many total liters, and that's gonna tell me the concentration, which we get 0 0.127 molar, and that's equal to the H plus concentration. Okay, so if I plug that into sulfur pH, negative log 0 0.127 molar, you're gonna get a pH that's equal to 0 0.90. Okay, so I'll do a quick recap of this problem. This one was a really good one. We first were given um, a reaction between a strong acid and a conjugate base. So the first most important step was figuring out what should our chemical reaction be? Okay, so um, once we wrote out the chemical reaction, we knew, okay, it has to have an arrow to the right. And because one of the things is, one of the substances is strong, we're gonna put our ice table in moles. So now I know calculate moles, figure out what I have left. I knew that there was no buffer because I ran out of my conjugate base part of the buffer. So there can't be any buffer. So that answered part A, there's no buffer. And then for part B, calculate pH. Because I have a strong and weak substance, you're just gonna calculate pH from the strong acid here. So I had the moles, I needed the H plus concentration. So I used this equation. And the only thing to remember here was that because we, consider a reaction, we need to look at the final volume because we have a new concentration of our acid. You can't just use this initial concentration because the reaction took place. And so you have a new concentration and a new volume. So we had to take into consideration the new volume. Then we solve for the new concentration of H plus, and then we plugged it in and we found our new pH of the solution. Okay. So I'll answer a couple um, of your questions that I see, but that is the end of the session. I hope you guys found it helpful. And I highly recommend um, coming to the midterm prep session if you can. Um, so if you guys understood these questions, that's awesome. The midterm prep session is gonna have completely different questions. It will have the same theory. So that is just gonna kind of be, we're gonna go through it a lot quicker because we have to go through not only this material, but also um, titrations and um, kinetics in the midterm prep session. Um, so we'll cover everything and it's going to be questions that you're likely to see on your midterm. I literally just changed numbers around from past midterms and we're going to go through those questions. So if you think you'd find that helpful, you guys can come to that. Um, and just one other quick thing for next week's weekly tutorial, um, we're thinking of putting that on the Friday, um, right before the midterm, I believe. So that will, weekly tutorial will cover the rest of the material we, we didn't get to. Again, it's going to have different questions in that midterm um, prep session. So you guys can 
decide what you want to come to if you want to come to both just the weeklies just the midterm preps from now on you guys got a taste of the weekly tutorial and what it is like um, it's similar to the midterm preps but just kind of um, more focusing on understanding and going through these problems some of them a lot of them were similar to exams as well just the midterm prep is completely focused on just the midterm we focus a lot less on understanding concepts okay so i hope you guys found that helpful and i'm going to answer your questions that i see here so um, someone asking about the reaction here i think above they're saying why did i put in oh minus so this was something that i touched on in the buffers here so when i add a strong base like sodium hydroxide i want to put the oh minus in the equation so that kind of is summarized really nicely in this note here you want to just put in oh minus the reason why i do that is just because it makes the um, equation a lot simpler. I end up having water, and so I can just ignore water completely. Um, whereas the equation gets a little bit more complicated if you just leave it in as sodium hydroxide. So that's why I prefer to write sodium, uh, just the hydroxide ions in the equation. It makes the equation a lot simpler, and it's it's uh, it's easier to not make mistakes when you do it this way. And that's also what what I showed here on the left when you have a strong acid. I, I um, show the H3O plus ions reacting with the base and then show the rest of the reaction. Again, you can ignore the water. Okay, so that's why um, in this problem, I just reacted with the hydroxide ions. And the problem we just did, I just reacted with the H3O plus, which came from the strong acid. NaOH and HCN. Oops. So someone is asking, how come we didn't have to consider the volumes of each of these since they are also reacting together? So the reason why we didn't have to do that here was because here we ended up with moles of a weak acid and its conjugate base. So here, because I wanted to figure out the pH of the solution, um, I knew that because I have a weak acid in its conjugate base, I can plug those mole values into the henderson hasselbalch equation, which is shown, and I'm able to use moles, okay? So I did not have to convert into concentration. If I did have to convert into concentration, we then talked about how you would have to use this con um, equation C is equal to N over V. And then because we're kind of looking at the final concentration, sorry about the dog, after the reaction, um, we're interested in the final concentration, you would plug in their moles and then you would plug in the total volume if you needed its concentration. Okay, and we did that for um, a later problem. We did that here, I think. Yeah, so here we had to do that where we had to consider the final volume um, because we needed a concentration. Whereas the problem above, we didn't need to use a concentration, we could just use moles because the henderson hasselbalch equation allows us to just plug in moles there and get our pH. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, does anybody else have any last minute questions? No, it looks like you guys are good. So I really hope you guys found that session helpful. We did a really good review of all of the basics of um, understanding acids and bases, which is gonna come in handy on your midterms and buffers. So you should have a really good under better understanding of buffers now. And hopefully I see you guys on the midterm session this Sunday, 11 a.m. it starts. Okay, and that one is gonna be long. We're gonna cover everything. So yeah, I hope you guys have a really nice weekend and a nice rest of your Friday. Bye.